Good afternoon, sir. Can you see and hear me? I can, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this afternoon we're going to hear from Sir Michael Hodgkinson. Yeah. I do solemnly, sincerely and truly, sincerely and truly declare, and affirm declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give, that the evidence I shall give shall, be the truth, shall be the whole truth, shall be the truth, the whole truth, the truth, the whole truth and nothing but, and the, nothing truth. but the truth. Thank you. Take Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you give your full name, please? Yep, Michael Stuart Hodgkinson. Um, so, Michael, you should have in front of you a witness statement. Uh, yep. Is it dated the 27th of February 2024? Yep. Uh, could I ask you to turn to the final page, please? Can you confirm that this is your statement? Yep. And on the final page, that's page 26, can you see a signature? I can. Is that your signature? It is. And is that statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, that witness statement, which has the URN WITN 10660100, uh, will be uploaded onto the inquiry's website shortly. Um, your career history is set out in your statement um, at length. And for, for today's purpose, I think all we need to know is that you uh, were the senior non-executive director of Royal Mail Holdings in January 2003 until August 2007, is that right? Correct. Uh, and also the chairman of Post Office Limited from May 2003 to March 2007. Correct. Thank you. Um, can I ask, if possible, for you to come slightly closer to the microphone? Sorry. Thank you. <coughs> After leaving Royal Mail and Post Office, uh, you held a variety of positions. You were deputy chairman of TUI Travel until 2018, um, and you also had various involvement with Transport for London, rail and airport uh, interests and companies. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, for those who aren't aware, uh, can you explain what Royal Mail Holdings was um, and its relationship to Post Office Limited? and also where the Royal Mail Group fell in with that. Right. <clears throat> the um, structure of the company was Royal Mail Holdings was the main company, and under it had um, several subsidiary companies. It had GLS, which was the parcel business in Europe. It had um, Parcel Force. It had Royal Mail Group and then Post Office. And your involvement with Royal Mail Holdings was principally because of your involvement with Post Office Limited, was it? Yep. Albeit that you had some degree of uh, oversight uh, of the whole group. Correct. Um, can you assist us with how decisions and strategies of the Post Office Limited board uh, informed or affected the goals of uh, the Royal Mail Holdings board and vice versa? Right. Um, obviously, the Royal Mail Holdings was a much bigger company, much bigger sums of money. But nevertheless, um, the post office was still a significant part of the business. And uh, unfortunately, at that time, it was still loss-making. So one of the strategies which was applicable to both the benefit of Royal Mail Holdings and for Post Office Limited is could we actually devise a strategy that would be much more financially viable for the post office company? Uh, and, and obviously how, that would have fed into Royal Mail Holdings. And how would the two boards relate it in respect of that? Right. The post office board reported into the Royal Mail Holdings board, and both the chief executive and the chairman of post office were on the Royal Mail board. Thank you. And we'll see in due course some minutes of various board meetings from, from both Post Office Limited and Royal Mail Holdings. <coughs> I want to ask you some general questions about the governance of uh, Post Office Limited. And I'm going to start um, in respect of board composition uh, and various committees. Um, could we bring up onto screen poll 00423140, please? Uh, 
triple zero zero four two three one four zero. Thank you very much. Um, I believe this is your first board meeting uh, as non-executive chairman of Post Office Limited. Correct. Um, just pausing at, at the very beginning, actually, where you're listed as non-executive chairman, can you assist us with why you were a non-executive chairman as opposed to an executive chairman? Just basically, that was the title that I had when I started. Um, I don't think there was anything specific. It was just that we were uh, part of the board, Royal Mail Board's non-executive team, and that just naturally carried down to post office. Thank you. Um, can you take us through, if we zoom out slightly, the, the general composition of the board when you first joined uh, in terms of executives, non-executives? Would it be helpful if I discuss what the company was looking like? Absolutely. Be because it wasn't a fully integrated company. It still was taking significant numbers of services from Royal Mail. So um, I think that's quite an important point to make before I get into the individuals. Uh, and why is it? Ba basically because we were part of an integrated company. And one of the reasons that uh, they wanted someone like myself to join as chairman of the post office was the thought that in the next three or four years that the Royal Mail letters business would be privatised. And you would then need to build up this separate post office company, not just to be what it was of the day, but to eventually bring in and on board all of the other aspects of services that the Royal Mail supplied and bring in full traditional corporate governance. So at this stage, May 2003, um, was it a company without full traditional corporate governance? Absolutely. There were no non-executive directors other than Alan Layton and for a brief period of time, there was Elmer Toime, who has, was doing an assignment with Royal Mail from New Zealand. Thank you. So, Michael, could I ask, if possible, for you to speak Sorry. slightly louder, if no, it's uh, okay. possible? Um, we see on the board there uh, um, apologies from the, um, for example, the chairman and the executive deputy chairman of Royal Mail Holdings, did they automatically have a seat on the board of the Post yep. Office Limited? Yep. Uh, and was it regular that they would attend or, or not attend? I think David Mills was always there, and Alan attended for quite a lot of the time. Uh, and was that one way in which there could be feedback from the developments of the Post Office Limited to the Royal Mail Holdings? Or was there some other route to... I, I think it was two things. I think one, yes, feedback back to Royal Mail Holdings, but I think Alan was quite keen to have a direct input into the Post Office as well. Thank you. We can zoom out of that. I'm, I'm going to bring up on screen, and perhaps actually at the same time, but side by side, um, some minutes from later in your time... Um, at the Post Office Limited. Can we look at poll 00021495, please? Thank you very much. So that's from October 2006. If, if it's possible to have those both on screen side by side, please. Thank you very much. And, and perhaps if we're able to zoom into the top half of both of those pages, um, slightly, slightly more if possible, sorry. That's okay. If we could zoom out slightly so that it has the full list of those present. Um, can you assist us with any significant changes that occurred in respect of the composition of the board between, say, 2003 and 2006 or, or even when you left? Well, the, the, the most significant change was the change in chief executive. Um, David Mills retired at the end of 2005 and uh, Alan Cook joined in, uh, I think it was March 2006. So that's the biggest change. 
but in addition, there had been several other retirements. So uh, David Miller had left operations, and um, we, we had new people on board there. We had, um, just looking through there, there was a new uh, personnel director, human resources. So there was a significant amount of change over that, what is um, three and a half year period. Um, so taking Alan Cook, he was brought on originally as a non-executive yep. director, but by 2006, he had become managing director. Yes. Um, by 2006, was the board any different in terms of uh, non-executive directors, or was it similarly uh, an executive-led board? It was basically still an executive-led board. We had in the interim, we had had Brian Goggin, who was the chief executive of the Bank in Ireland, on the board as a non-exec for about a two-year period. Uh, and can you assist us with the reasons behind that? Was it something of that particular time, It was that was routine, or was that something that was special to the post office or a little bit different? Uh, the, the post office had never had a non-executive director before I'd actually joined it. Um, we took Alan Cook on as a non-exec because I thought we desperately needed some uh, real-time, live, experienced person for selling financial services, which was the big business we were actually entering. Um, and, and, and that's why we, we hired Alan Cook as a non-executive director and also with a little bit of hope that he might eventually become the chief executive. Because again, I felt it was really important that we had someone who was very um, experienced, knowledgeable about um, selling financial services. He, he also had another very important feature, and that is he had been well known to government and well respected by government. We often see nowadays senior independent uh, directors. Was that a thought uh, that, that was considered in respect of the composition of the post office board? Not at that time, but that was in the back of my mind all the time, because one of the reasons that it was important that I had joined when I did was I, in the 18 months run up to any form of privatisation, would have to decide, first of all, what kind of corporate governance structure we needed for the post office going forward, and also um, what kind of individual experience would be helpful so that we would be ready to set up a uh, high-quality, standalone business. We see here also, on the left-hand side, we have uh, the chairman and executive deputy chairman of Royal Mail Holdings. By 2006, it seems to be the chairman um, of the Royal Mail Group. Can you assist us with that at all? Um, I don't think that is significant. I think that it's just the way the secretary noted the eight minutes. Thank you. Um, we have Alan Barry listed as IT director. Um, and that's on the left-hand side. Yep. I believe he left in 2004. Yep. But we later see on the right-hand side um, David Smith as IT delivery director. That's yep. um, not the David Smith that, that is a, in this phase. We, we heard from, yep. it, we know him yeah, as David yeah. X. Smith because yeah, yeah. of his email address. It's, yeah, yeah. Uh, he's listed as David X. Smith. <coughs> he was the IT delivery director. Um, is there a difference there? So in 2003, it looks as though you had an information technology director as a full member of the board, whereas by 2006, it seems as though the IT delivery director, David Smith, was only in attendance rather than uh, a full member. I think that is true. Um, we do see, however... Rick Francis, we can see apologies on the right-hand side, who is the operations director, and he seems to be a full member. Yeah, and um, he, he took over, really, the day-to-day -day management of IT. So, so are we to read into this that actually the information technology director was replaced at a higher level by an opera, a new operations director? Uh, well, the, the operations director was really replacing the old Dave Miller role. So that was the chief operating officer? Yeah. 
Yeah, so it, uh, he had a much wider remit than just yeah, yeah. the delivery of yeah. information technology. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, can you see any issue with that in, in that presumably the information technology director has a more hands-on um, dealings with, say, the Horizon system than possibly um, somebody at a higher level of operations director? I mean, that's a fair comment, but I think everybody had quite a high degree of confidence in um, David Smith. Um, and then it would be really up to Alan Cook as he came in to decide whether he wanted to make more changes to the board. On the right-hand side, you're now listed uh, as chairman rather than non-executive chairman. Was there a, a formal change over that period, or is that, again, just the minutes? Yeah, just the minutes. But looking at the structure, both in 2003 and later on, do, do you consider that the structure of the board of Post Office Limited provided sufficient challenge to the executives? It, I, mean, I think there was a fair bit of challenge on this board, but also the um, Post Office Chief Executive and myself were challenged quite strongly on things at the Royal Mail Holdings Board, because it was quite a significant subsidiary of um, the Holdings Board. So there, there was definitely some external challenge to what was going on. And whose job was it in particular to feed back to the Royal Mail Holdings Board? Basically, there was, a, if I remember correctly, um, there was a chief executive's report to each of the um, Royal Mail Holdings Board. Meetings. So in terms of responsibility, I know that both of you, that the chairman and the chief executive attended that board. Uh, did you principally see it as the chief executive's yep. role to feedback yep. rather than your role? Well, he would can be put reporting back in much more detail, yeah. Um, can you assist us also with the, the dynamics between the various individuals involved? Uh, were certain members more active or, or more open or more able uh, in the list that we see here? Did you have any particular concerns about any of those individuals? I mean, Peter Corbett was always a very solid finance director and always, always very sensible. Um, we had split, I think, the sales and the operations director because we were feeling we desperately needed more input to selling the new financial services. Um, but generally speaking, I, I would say that it was a relatively harmonious team who were working very solidly through the key objectives that we actually had. And the main objective we had was to have a credible plan for government by the end of 2006 for future funding. And that was the main focus of the board and had been the main focus of the board over the previous three years. And how would you describe your approach to your style of chairmanship of this particular board? Was it, um, were the meetings, for example, very prescribed? Were they very open, a free-for-all, or something else? Uh, the, meet, the meetings were um, clearly geared around achieving the core objectives that we had. So if you go back to the beginning, then the core objectives we had were to do the first round of post office rationalisation, to improve the, or to reduce the loss making uh, Crown Office branches, to um, judge over that period of time by, by myself the quality of the management, and, and as I say, to um, generally reduce costs over, over the operation. And, and those objectives stayed pretty much the same over the period, and I think you'll see. Um, a common theme with the big new theme coming in, which was the introduction of financial services. So the overall theme being reducing costs, increasing profitability. And introducing new products because we were at the time when the traditional product streams that were going through the post office were dying. So, you know, we knew that um, eventually pensions would be paid directly into pensioners' bank accounts. The uh, things like um, the uh, TV licenses, the car licenses, 
a whole range of the traditional products were actually moving away from the traditional post office. So it was absolutely vital that new services were brought in if there was to be any form of viable future. And we'll see in due course some serious <laughs> problems expressed at the board level about the solvency in 2006. Uh, was that it heightened in 2006 or was it a constant theme throughout your It was a constant theme throughout the whole period where the directors had to constantly be looking at this for fear of becoming vulnerable themselves for over-trading and being liable for creditors. <clears throat> when you started in your role, I think you were told that it was going to uh, take two days a week mm -hmm. to... Um, act as chairman of the board. Um, whilst you were chairman, you were also involved in a number of other companies. Yeah. I think you were non-executive director of something called FKI PLC, uh, which is an engineering and manufacturing company, yep. until July 2008. Is that right? Yes. Um, you were a board member of Transport for London and chairman of their finance committee between 2001 and 2012. Yep. Non-executive director of First Choice Holidays, uh, later TUI, including as chairman from uh, March 2004. Yep. Non-executive director of Dublin Airport between 2004 and 2010. Yep. Uh, the Post Office Limited nominated director on the board of Bank of Ireland because of that link between the two, um, between May 2004 and July 2006. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Taking, for example, the role... Uh, first choice holidays. Um, how many days a week did you tend to dedicate to that role? Basically, the first choice holidays was a unique situation insofar as I uh, really only needed to dedicate a day a week because we had a very unique situation that worked very well in that we had a lot of non-executive directors that had proper jobs during the week and one of the things that we did was before the board meeting, we would actually always have a non-executive director's dinner, which enabled the non-executive directors to discuss offline all of the kind of issues that they thought we needed to be addressing at the board. And then the next day, we would actually have the board meeting and all the committees so that these um, non-executive directors were effectively only taking out one day uh, for the process and then in addition to that I always had a dinner 10 days before the board meeting with the chief executive to get up to speed with what was going on and to decide the issues we need to put forward for the next board. Just, just pausing you there in respect to the post office we see and we've seen a lot of formal board minutes and committee minutes um, things like dinners and social meetings did they take place with for example, the chief executive of the post office? Um, not on a regular basis. Occasionally we would have a dinner, but basically no. Uh, was most of your business on the post office done in, in the formal structures of yep. committees? Yeah. And boards? Yes. Um, do you consider, given the large number of other involvements that you had at the time, that you uh, had enough time to dedicate to the role of chairman? Well, I thought at the time I did. I thought that I had planned my workload so that I had between a three quarters of a day and a day a week spare because I knew things would turn up, they always turn up. And that was where I was able to fit in the non-executive role of the Bank of Ireland because otherwise I couldn't have done it. And do you think a part-time chairman was the right approach for post office during this period? Given what people knew at the time, yes. And how do you distinguish that from what people know now? Uh, well, I guess the, the, the kind of big issues with Horizon, which just were not known. So do you think a full-time chairmanship would have made a difference in that respect? Or could have made a difference? I mean, it could possibly have made a difference. I, I, I can't say definitely. What is it that you would have done personally differently if you had been a full-time chairman of post office? I think based on the information that we actually had at the time, we, I would probably have spent more time with the uh, joint venture company between the Bank of Ireland and post office for developing the financial services because that was the key product 
and that was where we had the troubles or the problems. Uh, thank you. Th those can come down. I'm going to ask you about committees. You've said in your statement at paragraph 31 that post office didn't have any of its own subcommittees when you joined and you introduced the Risk and Compliance Committee um, and you say that that wasn't unusual for a subsidiary. Um, is that right even in respect of a subsidiary of the size uh, of Post Office Limited? Um, I think the, if you look at things like um, you know, a nominations committee, remuneration committee, they can be done through a, 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 a committee that, based on something the size of the Royal Mail Holdings. Um, but I think, um, again, when you go down into things like risk and day-to-day -day stuff, which is why we set up the Risk and Compliance Committee, we should have our own starting point of, of understanding what we might need going forward. Did it surprise you that when you joined that the Post Office didn't have that kind of a committee in place? No, knowing the knowledge of the business when I joined, because the business when I joined was very clearly that each individual company was using the committees of the central services. So remuneration, audit, uh, nominations, so all the conventional board committees. Uh, and, and it was only going to develop its own committees as it went forward. The, the main lurch forward would have been when we finally got to the point of a privatisation. And in the run-up to the privatisation, that's when the new corporate governance processes would be introduced. Given the size of the company, though, not necessarily profitability, but certainly national importance, yeah. um, do you think that dealing with things at that higher level, the Royal Mail Holdings level, was actually too high? Probably. Which is why, as I say, we introduced the Risk and Compliance Committee to start get, looking at things more locally. And how about a company that is involved in the prosecution of people? Do you think that special rules should apply in, in respect of those kinds of committees? I think that's fair comment. Were you aware of the significance of, uh, for example, prosecutions when you joined the um, post no, office? No, I definitely not. One of the reasons that you introduced that committee, you've said in your statement, was because the plan was for the post office to progress into the financial market and, and need for greater corporate governance in respect to the financial market. Um, can you tell us why the financial market aspect was seen as particularly important? Right. That, I mean, that, that was very important. Um, be, first of all, it was new products for us, so there was no real history. Secondly, these products were becoming more and more regulated and each product had to be not only designed to meet the regulation but sold in a way that matched the approved selling processes for those financial regulated products. And we were looking at bigger and bigger, wider and wider ranges of those products. So in order to keep some form of control, we had to have our own risk and compliance committee purely for financial services. Does it strike you as interesting that a company would approach um, its involvement in financial markets as perhaps more serious from a risk perspective than a company that prosecutes people or is involved in the prosecution of people? Um, yeah, I mean, that's fair comment. Um, you also say in your statement, paragraph 32, that with privatisation of Royal Mail Holdings, uh, further committees would eventually be required. Yeah. Um, why would privatisation change the position? I think fundamentally the cost base of the business and obviously setting up your own complete new corporate governance processes was going to be quite expensive. And if you could still use the Royal Mail Holdings ones, then that was a sensible way to go forward until there was clarity of what was going to happen. Um, the post office was wholly owned by government. Uh, to what extent did you consider the corporate governance rules of, say, a commercially listed, uh, uh, listed company to be applicable to a wholly owned, government-owned company? 
Well, the, the um, private listed company rules were pretty stringent and you had to follow pretty strict guidelines. Um, so there was nothing wrong with the corporate governance principles of a PLC. The issue when you were part of government was you needed to get involved in other areas for which the government might want to deviate from a conventional private profit related company. And the classic case in the case of the post office was the funding of the rural network. Um, and so we always were um, having discussions not just about running the profit side of the business, but also making sure that the social responsibility side of the business could be met. I hope this isn't too technical a question, but corporate governance rules that apply to private companies, such as financial reporting councils, combined code, did you see those as applying to Post Office Limited, or was it something different because it was government-owned? I think we were aiming to replicate over time, the, the PLC corporate government codes. So when you started, did you inherit a company that was or was not closely aligned to um, those? In, in the post office? Yes. Yeah, no, it, it didn't, didn't have all those corporate governance procedures there. And by the time you left, do you consider that there was an improvement uh, and how significant was that improvement? Well, there was an improvement insofar as we had the Risk and Compliance Committee, which was the basis of moving forward. And that committee was evolving all the time as we tried to broaden, broaden its scope. Um, <clears throat> so that was the start, but it, it could by no means be the end. And so are we to take it that you didn't see that kind of a committee as mandatory, but you were building it up in order to try and closely replicate the private yep. sector. Yes. Yeah, and, and, and also that we knew we would absolutely have to have it in, you know, maybe one, two years' time. So get, getting, getting it going sooner rather than later was a sensible proposition. Um, what difference did you see in respect to the governance of a publicly listed company um, and a publicly owned company? The, I need to think through that in two stages. The, the, the first stage was that post office was not, as I say, a fully-fledged company, so didn't have a suite of corporate governance processes that you would have expected to see in a PLC. So that is a fairly significant difference from when you start. Um, when you move to the next stage, when that's all set up, um, then I think the only major difference would be if you're fully owned by the government, then obviously you have one shareholder to agree your corporate strategy with. So that is quite different from the private sector. And what role did you see for government and for the civil service playing in that overall governance picture? Well, the, the biggest role in the, for the post office was really twofold. One, um, there was this whole question about funding the social network, uh, and which was an absolutely crucial part of the debate and discussions with government. And then the second issue, which is you referred to earlier, which comes up time and time again, is given that we would require money from the government going forward, then there was constant debate about how could we actually get the money what, what security did we actually have over the commitments and how did that result in the issues we had to face with day-to-day -day trading? <clears throat> and what, if any, conflicts of interest did you see in uh, the ownership of the post office by the government? I, d I don't think there was any particular conflict. And I, I'll be honest, I, I never thought it was ever going to be a private company. I thought it would be a standalone, fully government-owned company. <clears throat> and why did you think that? I thought that the um, social issues surrounding the um, size of the network were probably never going to go away and were always going to be up for constant debate. And when you uh, need a substantial sum of money 
other than from private markets who can see a return, you're always going to be vulnerable. And it, that never struck me as being a uh, thing that would be capable of being a private company. I want to On ask you about own. prosecutions and, and the horizon <coughs> system. And we're going to come back and look at specifics. Um, but where did you consider oversight and accountability uh, in respect of the investigation and prosecution functions to, to lie within the company? I think there was, there was an underlying assumption that there was a secure chain with several people's involvement insofar as everybody at the time thought Horizon data was accurate. You then had the, uh, line, well, you then had the audit process. You then had line management who had to make a decision. There was then a separate investigation process. And then finally, there was a legal process if it got that far. So there were many, many people in the chain that needed to be convinced that the process was reasonable. Was there a specific mechanism for feedback to the board or to the chair um, in respect of the investigation and prosecution function? No, there wasn't. Um, who would you have expected to have fed back to the board in respect of that function? I would have expected the chief operating officer and the chief executive to have reported that back. Um, same question, but for contractual and personnel management of sub-postmasters. Um, so where do you consider the oversight and accountability um, for those to, to lie? Well, that was, that was clearly in the chief operating officer's area. And again, was there a specific mechanism for feeding back, or was that that was, that was very much board? delegated? Um, where did you consider oversight and accountability for issues relating to the Horizon system itself to lie? That would be with the post office board. The post office board. Yep. Uh, and do you recall any specific mechanisms for reporting and feeding back on that to the board? There were, there were constant reports to the board on how the uh, system needed to be developed going forward. And there were kind of three phases there. There were lots of individual projects that would come up. Like, for example, I remember the um, foreign exchange had been uh, done on a separate terminal. And we wanted to get it onto the Horizon terminal, so there was a, a project that asked for money to do that and that was not unusual to get products doing that. There was then the uh, two major projects which actually uh, occurred during my period. Well one occurred and one was being planned. One was impact and then the other was the next generation. So there was a lot of feedback to the board generally about Horizon but mainly on a forward-looking basis because, as I say, there was a very strongly held view that Horizon was good. And who was it that you would expect to feed back to the board in respect of that information? Well, that would be both the IT director in the early days, then the IT director and the operations guy, and then also the finance director. And why the finance director? Well, because he really was the main driver behind the impact project. Putting those three together, uh, did the board, so far as you recall, ever receive notice of concerns about prosecutions relating to Horizon or problems with the Horizon system itself? I, I was not made aware of those. I, I'd just like to read paragraph 38.1 of your statement, which addresses the legal department. It says, um, I do not believe the board had direct oversight or involvement with the legal department, and I do not recall the structure of the legal team. This was ultimately a responsibility of the CEO and COO. Um, we saw when we started today the board composition. It doesn't seem yep. as though there was what you might see nowadays, a general counsel, yep. or someone of an equivalent position. Um, was there, in your view any gap in relation to oversight of the legal department at the post office? I think there was, and I think that was part of the fact that some of the, cent some of the functions remain central. Can you expand on that, please? Um, I think we, we had a subset of the Royal Mail legal department. And what was the problem with that? I think then uh, it wasn't represented on its own right on the poll board. And did that change at all during your time? No. 
Was that something you were aware of at the time, or is that looking back now? Um, I think more looking back. More broadly, how would you see the experience of sub-postmasters reach board level? Um, was there data collection surveys, one-on-one -on -one discussions with, for example, the NFSP or the CWU? There were, as far as I'm aware, regular discussions of the operations team with the NFSP. And um, one would have assumed that if they had big problems, they would have been feeding back, um, which I was not aware of. Was there any way to directly feed back the experience of sub-postmasters, for example? I'm not aware of surveys that were done. No. Um, do you think in some way that might have been affected by the nature of the contract with sub-postmasters, uh, where, for example, a sub-postmaster wasn't necessarily considered to be an employee of post office and they weren't necessarily treated in the same way they were something else, something outside of... We were, we were certainly doing very big surveys of our own internal staff, and you'll probably see all the way through, uh, both Royal Mail and the Post Office board minutes, the um, have your say results. As far as I know, they were not done with the external postmasters. And can you assist us with really how the board saw sub-postmasters? and saw the role of the sub-postmaster? I think the board thought, saw the role of the postmasters as a very important part of the overall package. Um, they were going to be very important in actually selling the financial services that we hoped would form the basis of the company's future profitability. They were also crucial in um, supporting the social obligations that the, postmaster, the, the, the post office had. So I think they were a pretty important part of the business. And in those circumstances, you've said that there was a lot of feedback provided by employees of, of yeah. the post office. In circumstances where sub-postmasters were seen as important, why do you think it was that there wasn't that level of feedback being obtained from sub-postmasters? I can't answer that question properly because it wasn't discussed at the time. But I personally think that it was because people saw the sub-postmasters as highly motivated individual businesses, whereas our employees, we had a major responsibility to motivate them. And with all of the headcount reductions that were taking place, obviously morale was quite a challenge, and we were constantly trying to keep in touch with how we felt the, the, the vast majority of the staff felt. If I may pick up on a particular word that you used, you, you said businesses. Was it that sub-postmasters were seen as businesses rather than individuals, humans? I think, I think they were probably, yeah. Um, I'm going to move on to the Risk and Compliance Committee that you set up. And I'd like to start with uh, some board minutes that refer to its establishment. Can we look at poll 00021486? This is a board meeting of the 15th of December 2004. And we see there, just while we're on this page, we can see David Smith, that's David X. Smith, uh, delivery director, acting IT director at that stage. Could we turn to page six, please? I'm just going to read to you from the bottom of that page and over to the next page. Um, this refers to the Risk and Compliance Committee being established. Peter Corbett provided a short presentation to highlight the work of the newly formed Risk and Compliance Committee. And then it goes on to show the various things that the board noted. The Risk and Compliance Committee was chaired by Sir Michael Hodgkinson. Um, Graham Halliday and David Miller regularly contributed to it. The scope uh, of its activity included audit, compliance, and legal issues. Uh, just pausing there, did you expect that major litigation risks would be raised at, in this forum? 
Not initially, but uh, it's something that one would have expected to move forward as, as we develop the committee. And why not initially? I think just because there was just time to um, get the thing going. This was an entirely new process. We had entirely new lots of information flow to understand. So one of its long-term purposes would be to have major litigation risks brought to that committee? Eventually, yeah. Eventually. Um, its primary aim was to ensure the service and conformance elements of the business were working together properly. Uh, Rod Ismay was working closely with Lynn Hobbs and Tony Marsh to help ensure this is achieved. The next quarterly meeting will be on the 5th of January 2005 to discuss branch control, vital few controls, audit reports, anti-money laundering measures, crime and fraud, and the work of the group audit committee. Uh, then says the risk and compliance committee <coughs> found that although the overall trend of losses due to fraud had fallen from an annual rate of 29 million to 20 million, uh, this area still represented a significant risk. Um, if there were concerns about Horizon, problems with the integrity of Horizon, was this the committee to, to bring those kinds of problems to? It would certainly have been one of the committees. I think if people had thought there were big problems with Horizon, they would have come, first of all, to the board, but they could also have come and should also have come to this committee. So would this committee have a wider or narrower remit? You say for, they should have gone to the board. Well, I think they would go to both because of the importance. We see a, a number of names there, Rod Ismay, Lynn Hobbs, Tony Marsh. Uh, were they tasked with bringing risks to the committee, setting the agenda, or, or was that some, somebody else? Um, they, were, they were tasked with um, bringing you know, the risk to the committee. Um, the agenda would be set by uh, Peter Corbett and myself. Um, and then each person that attended would have, a, you know, their, their own rights to um, talk about what they wanted to talk about so that we had a fairly open agenda. Um, we've just recently <laughs> spoken about the role of sub-postmasters. Uh, where did sub-postmasters, if at all, fit in uh, with the company's consideration of, of risk? I mean, we see their reference to fraud. Was it concerned principally with the risks that sub-postmasters posed, uh, or, or did it consider risks to sub-postmasters? It, it, con it considered risks to the whole business. So it was considering risks to the company for fraud, which would have included uh, postmasters, but it also included um, crime risks in other areas of, of, of fraud, such as the uh, Crown offices and also the cash and transit next work. So um, it, it, it was a, you know, fairly broad in its thought processes on fraud. In terms of major projects, so something like Horizon Online, was this a committee that would deal with that or was there a separate major projects committee? The um, Horizon, um, you know, for example, impact, that, that would not have... The way that project would have been approved and developed would not have come through this committee and until it was operational. <clears throat> was there a separate major projects committee or equivalent? There was not a separate committee as such, but there were groups of people who were formed to judge committee, you know, projects, viability, et cetera, et cetera. And they would then report to the board. Um, and finally, how about whistleblowing? Where did that fit into the overall picture? Whistleblowing was just generic, and they would have, any, any whistleblower would have had the right to blow the whistle to any single board member, me, or wherever they thought would get the best, you know, listening. But do you recall any particular processes being in place at that time? No. Um, can we please look at poll 00021420, please? These are some minutes from a risk and compliance committee. If we scroll down, please, we can see there at the very bottom of this page, it says, following appointment as managing director, Alan Cook to resign from this committee. Um, 
this is the committee that addresses risk. Am I right to say that if you held the position of managing director, it wasn't seen as somehow appropriate for you to be on that committee? Right. There was, there was a big debate which went backwards and forwards as to whether Alan should be off this committee because this committee was independent and governance or whether he should be on it because all of the stuff that was being talked about was quite important. And eventually, I think, uh, and I think the record will show that Alan decided it was important enough for him to continue attending. But there was a, an iteration when we were debating how appropriate that was, and that's what this refers to. So ultimately, during the course of your time um, at the post office, the managing director in some capacity was attending those meetings? Uh, at the beginning, the managing director did not attend, so I don't think David Mills ever attended. Um, as I say, this would have been Alan's almost first week, and, and he, um, I think, I can't remember, did he actually attend? If you scroll down, or up? I think actually, if we look at the top, it, it says he, he sent his apologies. Right, okay. But he, he, was, he was actually debating whether he should or should not come. Thank you. I'm now going to turn to some board minutes. Can we please look at poll 00021482, please? Uh, we're now on the 19th of June 2003, so this is likely to be the second yep. board meeting that you attended. Uh, and we have Alan Barry there as Information Technology yep. Director. Uh, so this is at, at a time where the Information Technology Director was a full board member, it seems. Is that right? Yep. Um, do you recall who reported to him? Was it a particular team, individuals, or, or something else? I, I can't remember the teams. Um, would you have expected him to have been apprised of any issues with Horizon? I would have thought so. If we look over the page, page two, please. We have chairman's business. Yep. And the second entry there is Horizon. And it says, the chairman expressed a particular interest in furthering his understanding of the capabilities and limitations of the Horizon system. Uh, meetings would be arranged with the appropriate managers to provide the chairman with a detailed overview. Um, can you assist us with why Horizon was a particular interest of yours so early on in your time? Right. Um, I, I, by that time, had formed, uh, based on all the conversations and, and visits that I'd had, that in fact Horizon was um, a well-regarded, well-performing system. However, we were just about to launch into a whole new array of new products and it didn't necessarily mean, for me coming into the business, that in fact the system was, uh, first of all, capable of adapting to those new products, and secondly, uh, was it um, suitable for those products? So I said it would be very important for me to at least gain an impression as to whether people in the development of Horizon had actually thought through the future rather than just today. So that was the purpose of this particular question. We have there Alan Barry's name under mm -hmm. action. Um, was there a number of people that you spoke to about Horizon at this time? On this particular issue? Uh, well, it, it seems as though there's going to be um, a, a meeting with appropriate managers. Yeah. Do you recall who you met with? Right. The, the answer is I can't recall who I met with. I assume but I can't prove it, that Alan Barry set it up. We could not get any minutes from the archive to see who had actually attended. But I do remember that between three and five people attended this meeting. And, and that was when they went through their view of what the future capabilities were. And were they all from the post office? Well. I, I had thought that there was someone from Fujitsu, but there is no way that we could prove that one way or the other, and they, that may have not been the case, but that's what I thought. Now, the way that you've explained it 
seems to be that the focus is on the future rather yeah, than... that was the future, yeah. I wanted to know, because not, not only were the new products quite different, but um, if you go down, you know, let's say the system goes down for an hour with uh, some products, it's a nuisance. But if, and you see it all the time, if the banking system goes down, it's a crisis. And given that, you know, we were government owned, I wanted to understand whether we not only had the ability of the um, system itself to handle the new products, but the resilience to actually handle them. So that was the purpose of the questions. And was it a single meeting? Were there a series of meetings? That was a single, well, it was a single long meeting, if I remember. Do, do you recall in the early days of your time as chairman, more meetings than this relating to Horizon? Not that particular issue. As I, I think I said earlier, Horizon was a constant issue because there were constant requests for money to upgrade the thing to handle this particular new product, that particular new product, and then the big products of um, impact and new generation. Um, during this particular meeting or any other meetings around this approximate time, um, did anybody raise any concerns about the integrity or reliability of Horizon? No, nope, not at all. Um, I want to take you chronologically up to 2007, um, and we'll be looking at some board minutes to see, not just board minutes, but contemporaneous documents, to see the kinds of things that were known to some people within the business. Um, I'd like to start with poll 00028438, please. Um, this is a document that we saw in phase two of the inquiry, phase two related to the procurement of the um, Horizon system and the early days of the Horizon system. Uh, sorry, it's, it's not that. It's poll 00028439, 39 rather than 38. We have it. Uh, this, it, it's a letter from Ernst and Young to Mr. Miller. It's dated the 23rd of August, 1999. Uh, David Miller at that stage, I think, was the managing director of the post office network until 2001. Uh, we heard from him in phase two. Um, he became the operations director, uh, which in 2004 was renamed the COO. And we've seen him appear in a number of those board minutes. I'm just going to read to you a, a few extracts from this letter. <coughs> um, this is at the acceptance testing phase of Horizon. Uh, and Ernst and Young wrote in, in the following terms. They say, as auditors of the post office, we've been asked by the post office counters limited to provide you with our views in respect of certain accounting integrity issues arising from tests performed by Post Office Counters Limited on Horizon data in the live trial. I'll just skip down to where it says the following issue, as described to us by Post Office Counters Limited, gives us concern as to the ability of Post Office Counters Limited to produce statutory accounts to a suitable degree of integrity. We understand that Post Office Counters Limited has attributed a severity rating of high to this matter. Uh, incident 376, Data Integrity. Uh, in order to test the integrity of weekly polling of Horizon Cash Account transactions, uh, Post Office Counters Limited are uh, reconstructing a weekly total by outlet from daily Horizon pollings. At present, this control test is showing discrepancies in that certain transactions do not record the full set of attributes, and this results in the whole transaction being lost from the daily polling. Um, during your inquiries into Horizon, or at any time, uh, did anybody tell you about the history of the acceptance process uh, and matters such as this, concerns about data integrity during that period? No, never. No. Um, and if we go back please, to poll 
Thank you very much. These were the minutes of the 19th of June, 2003. Uh, we see there David Miller, who was the addressee of that Ernst & Young letter, um, sat on the board as chief operating officer uh, as a full board member. Is that correct? Yep. Yes. Um, can we please look at poll 00021485? These are the board minutes from October the 13th, 2004. We again have Mr. Miller attending as a board member. If we could please look at page 10. We have there a presentation relating to Horizon Next Generation business case. David Smith presented the Horizon Next Generation business case to the board, uh, and it details there the presentation that was received by the board. Um, could we turn over the page to page 13? We have a presentation there under human resources uh, there's a report that the board agreed that in situations where fraud had been perpetrated against the company, the appropriate civil orders would be used immediately and in advance of any criminal proceedings. Uh, this would help recovery efforts by ensuring that the assets of those involved in, in, in criminal activity were quickly secured. David Miller would verify the current procedures and report back to the board. Um, so did Mr. Miller, who, as we see, is present and involved in matters relating to, for example, uh, criminal proceedings at that board meeting, did he ever raise at those board meetings where the topic of Horizon was addressed any concerns about Horizon integrity, Horizon reliability, or any concerns about the impact or potential impact on prosecutions? As I say, I, I never heard any serious concerns about the horizon integrity raised when I was there at the board. Thank you. I'm going to move on in time to uh, one of our case studies from phase four, and that's the case of Julie Wollstoneholm. Can we please look at WITN 00210101, please? Uh, now, I don't expect you to have looked at this document at all during your time um, at the post office. Uh, but I'm just going to take you to a couple of paragraphs just to give you a flavor of this particular case. Um, this is an expert, a joint expert report that was obtained in the case of Mrs. Wollstoneholm. Uh, and I'm just going to read to you from page two, please. If we scroll down page two, um, Mr. Coyne, the expert, says as follows. He says, this, in my opinion, is not a true representation on the evidence that I have had access to. Uh, of the 90 or so fault logs that I have reviewed, 63 of these are without doubt system-related failures. Only 13 could be considered as Mrs. Walson home calling the wrong support help desk, requesting answers to how do I type training questions. Uh, the majority of the system issues were screen locks, freezes, and blue screen errors, which are clearly not the fault of Mrs. Orson Holmes making, but most probably due to faulty computer uh, hardware, software interfaces, or power. If we scroll down, please, over the page, he gives their further opinion. If we scroll down to the final couple of paragraphs, just to give you a flavor of this case uh, that the inquiry's heard a, a lot about already. It says, from the 31st of October, there seems to be a number of logs which talk of large discrepancies in stock figures, trial balances with all sorts of figures showing minus figures. And the next paragraph says, although the documents do not list an upgrade taking place, it seems that these large reported discrepancies occur very frequently and shortly after the noted upgrade. If we please go on to poll 00118229. This is again a document that we saw back in the beginning of phase four of this inquiry. It's the advice 
uh, from counsel in that particular case. I'm just going to read to you some very short extracts on page three, please. Um, counsel says as follows, uh, he, he summarizes the, the case as follows, uh, Mrs. Wollstoneholm has defended the proceedings claiming that the computer system installed by the post office was defective and this was in fact the cause of losses recorded within her accounts. Uh, the next paragraph says the trial of this matter is now a month away, a joint computer experts report has been obtained, uh, this report concludes from limited records available that the computer system installed by the post office did appear defective. If we go over to page 15, please. At the bottom of page 15 has counsel's conclusions. And he says, on the basis of the above, it can be concluded that the post office claim against Mrs. Wollstoneholm will fail uh, save for her return of the equipment, which she has possibly retained. Her claim against the post office in respect of failure to give proper notice is likely to succeed. Uh, what is the appropriate course of conduct in these circumstances, particularly given the desire of those instructing me and the post office uh, to avoid, if possible, publication of the negative experts' report in the public arena? So it seems as though counsel has been instructed um, if possible, to avoid publication of that report that we have just seen. Um, a final document in relation to this matter. Can I take you to poll 00142503, please? Uh, and this is an email from Rod Ismay relating to the settlement of that case. And you can see the subject legal case, Cleveley's Mrs. Wollstoneholm. And he says, in summary, we suspended Mrs. Wollstoneholm in 2001 after apparent discrepancies in her cash accounts. Uh, we claimed for the value of these losses and she counterclaimed for loss of earnings. Within her claim was an expert's opinion which was unfavorable concerning Horizon and Fujitsu. Uh, we've lodged 25,000 pounds in court, but Mrs. Wollstoneholm has no legal representation and is pursuing the full amount of her claim, 188,000 pounds. It goes to court next month. Uh, and then it says, Mandy, Peter Corbett is on holiday now. So Peter Corbett was the finance director who we've seen attend, attended board meetings. Yep. Um, I'm therefore escalating this to David Miller, again, chief operating officer, also attended board meetings. Uh, do you have a copy of the IT expert's opinion? Uh, so they were both, Peter Corbett and David Miller were members of the board. Um, Mr. Miller's evidence to, to the inquiry is likely to be that he did sign off the settlement uh, of that claim and is likely to say um, that he questioned whether there were problems with Horizon arising from this case and was told by Tony Marsh that there weren't. Um, but did he ever raise, for example, at board level or with you personally, a significant payment relating to a Horizon related case? I, I really don't remember that. Right. And would you have expected uh, significant settlement sums to have been raised at board level? I would have thought so. Um, can I please turn to poll 00119895, please? <clears throat> We're now moving to December 2005. Again, this is not a document that you would have seen at the time. Um, it is a meeting. There's <coughs> present is Keith Baines. Do you recall Mr. Baines? I, I don't recall. Uh, we have Mandy Talbot, who's the litigation team leader. I'm just going to read a few extracts from this document. Um, findings, and it says as follows. There's no generally understood process for identifying emergen, emerging cases in which the integrity of accounting information produced by Horizon may become an issue. There are a number of channels by which such cases may enter the post office, and it refers to a flip chart list. 
and there is no process for making information about them available to all relevant functions. This increases the risk that different parts of the business may be dealing with the same issue and not coordinating responses. Uh, could we go over the page, please? Thank you. Paragraph 5 says, To date, the number of cases in which the integrity of Horizon data has been an issue is small. However, recent correspondence in the sub-postmaster uh, may well cause an increase. Also, there may also be uh, an effect from the introduction of transaction corrections replacing error notices. If we scroll down, please, to paragraph 8. It says, if all potential cases were to require horizon data to be analyzed early in the process, then the workload would be considerable, and much uh, would later prove unnecessary. Currently, there are around 12 suspensions per week, and a significant proportion of them will relate to financial discrepancies. Most of these are subsequently settled by agreement or are not contested. Where a case does go to court, it is essential that post office is able to refute any suggestion that Horizon is unreliable in general, or that it could have caused a specific losses to the sub-postmaster bringing the case. The evidence needed for these two points will be different. Just pausing there, it seems from a reading of this document that there are uh, a, a growing number of cases relating to uh, Horizon, <laughs> Uh, and there is a concern amongst the business to coordinate those and to assure that the post office is able to refute any suggestion that Horizon is unreliable. Do you agree with that as a, a fair summary? That's what this seems to say. Uh, and if we go over the page, please, to page three. Recommendations, a coordination role should be established to maintain a list of all current civil cases and potential civil cases where accuracy of horizon accounting information may be an issue and ensure that all relevant business functions are made aware of these cases. If we scroll over, please, to page five, we have there under specific actions, it says KB, that's Keith Baines, to brief Dave Smith on the meeting's recommendations. Um, that's David X. Smith, who we saw previously regularly attended board meetings. Yeah, the IT, yeah. Um, <coughs> can we please also look at RMG 00000131. This, these are minutes of the board meeting. Um, this is two months earlier, so October the 19th, 2005. We see if we scroll down, we have the names David uh, Rochel and David Smith, IT Delivery Director. And if we turn to page nine, there is halfway down, there's a presentation to the board on a horizon proposition. It says Rick Francis introduced Dave Smith and Ian O'Driscoll. A presentation uh, was provided on the Horizon Next Generation, and it notes various things from the board. So uh, around the time, slightly before um, that meeting that we just saw, uh, Mr. Smith was presenting to the board on matters relating to Horizon. Uh, did Mr. Smith ever raise any concerns with Horizon integrity, Horizon reliability, uh, or the growing number of cases challenging Horizon, uh, either with the board or with you personally? No, don't think so. Um, while we're on this document, if we could just turn to the first page, we see there the name Rick Francis, now Operations Director, as a full member of the board. That's October 2005. Can we please look at poll 00081928, please? <clears throat> uh, now, this is a series of emails, again, not ones that you, you would have seen at all. But can we please look at page five? We're in February 2006. If we scroll, zoom out slightly, we can see that this is an email chain. And on that chain, we have uh, somebody called Gary Blackburn, who is listed as Resolutions Manager uh, Operations. Uh, and also, if we scroll down the page, we have Lynn Fallowfield, Problem Manager Operations. 
would they have fit? Um, I took you just now to Rick Francis, operations director. Uh, were those roles we see there, the word <coughs> operations, do they fit under, under him? Um, could you go back to the previous one? The, the previous document or the... No, no, the previous name. Previous name, yes. If we scroll up, it's Gary Blackburn, Resolution Manager, Post Office Limited Operations. I'm, I'm honestly not sure where they would have figured in the, uh, the organisation. If Rick Francis's title was Operations Director, is it likely or unlikely that they would have fit under him? Or are you not able to assist? I, I on, honestly can't answer that question. I, I don't know. They, they, could, they could be in finance, but I, I just don't know. Would they be reporting to somebody who attended the board in some way? Uh, they would certainly be part of a chain of people reporting to the board, but they may not have been the immediate next report. Who, who is, in your view, the likely board member that they would have reported to? Or are you not able to assist? I, mean, I, I honestly can't tell you. I, I really don't know. I, I don't recognise the names. No. Uh, well, if we scroll over the page, I'm just going to briefly read to you from this email chain. It's one that the inquiry has seen before. It relates to uh, what's known as the calendar square bug. Uh, and this is an email <coughs> from Chambers. Uh, and it relates to a problem at, at the calendar square branch. Uh, and Anne Chambers says as follows. She says, ha haven't looked at the recent evidence, but I know in the past this site uh, had hit this riposte lock <coughs> problem two or three times within a few weeks. Uh, this problem has been around for years and affects a number of sites most weeks. And finally, uh, Isha say that they have done something about it. I'm interested in whether they really have fixed it, uh, which is why I left the call open, to remind me to check over the whole estate once S90, that's a particular release, it is live. Uh, call me cynical, but I do not a, just accept a third party's word that they fix something. Uh, what I never got to the bottom of, having usually had more pressing things to do, uh, was why this outlet was particularly prone to the problem, uh, possibly because they follow some particular procedure, sequence, which makes it more likely to happen. Uh, this could still be worth investigating, especially if uh, they have continuing problems, but I don't think it's worthwhile until that particular fix has taken place. Uh, she says, please note that the known error logs tell the help desk that they must contact sites and warn them of balancing problems if they notice the event storms uh, caused by the held lock and advise them to reboot the affected counter before continuing with the balance. Unfortunately, in practice, it seems to take uh, SMC several hours to notice these storms by which time the damage may have been done. If we scroll over the page very, very briefly at the bottom of that page, there's, there's an exchange there that refers to various um, reports that have been made. And it says at the bottom of this email, uh, read the magical 43,000 pounds appearing and disappearing. Uh, the postmaster is a male. He reports. Uh, you may recall that in September, the above office had major problems with the Horizon system relating to transfers between stock units. Uh, the sub-postmaster has reported uh, that he is again experiencing problems with transfers, which resulted in a loss of around £43,000, which subsequently rectified itself. Sub-postmaster is concerned, etc. Now, I certainly don't expect you to have seen this particular correspondence. Um, but just like my questions relating to Mr. Miller and Mr. Smith, uh, did Mr. Francis or, or whoever may have been the ultimate line manager to uh, those individuals in the operations department ever raise any concerns about the integrity or reliability uh, of Horizon with the board at, at this particular time? No. Um, Mr. Miller, Mr. Smith, Mr. Francis, all attending board meetings, uh, no mention of horizon integrity or reliability issues, no mention of no. a growing number of court cases that we've seen. Uh, w what do you think went wrong 
in terms of the ability to report these kinds of things to the board and come down? It's difficult to answer that question. I, one would have thought they would have been reporting those kind of things, but they didn't, and I can't give an answer. Thinking about the documents you've seen, the experience you've had subsequently, is there something in particular that you can pinpoint that you think went wrong in that reporting line to the board? Well, there were three people involved, as you said, so you'd have thought that um, one way or the other it would have got to the board. I, I, I just got no idea. So might that be an appropriate moment to take our mid-afternoon break? Yes, of course. Uh, um, so, Michael, just pursuing one aspect of that, um, I can understand how the more senior these people are, the more discretion they may have to act, and they make a judgment about whether to bring things to the board, etc. But going back to Mrs. Wilson Holmes case, where she is claiming £188,000 from the post office, which in 2003-04 is a substantial amount of money. And I don't know precisely how much uh, Mrs. Wilson, Mrs. Wilson whom was paid, but all the indications are that it was a very significant sum of money. Um, I'm intrigued as to how that could have happened without the board being involved. C c can you help me with that? I, I've got no idea. I would agree with you. It was a very large sum of money uh, in any day, um, and particularly in those days. Um, I, I, I mean, you can speculate, but I, I, I can't... Uh... Oh, I, that, that's fine, but am I right in thinking that in terms of corporate governance, it should have been brought to the attention of the board and signed off at that level? Uh, a, a, a potential legal case of that size, in my opinion, should have been reported to the board. Fine, thank you. All right, yes, let's have our break, uh, Mr Blake. What time thank should we start? Thank you very much. If we could return at a quarter to four, please. Yeah, fine. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Can you see and hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Michael, I, I only have a few more documents to take you to. Um, the first that I'm going to take you to is actually to go back to a document that we looked at earlier. It's poll 00021420, and it's the minutes of the Risk and Compliance Committee. Um, just out, out of absolute fairness to you, if we look at the final page of this particular meeting, um, there is in an appendix the discussion about the status of the impact programme. And I think yep. we discussed earlier uh, about what level yeah, yeah. the impact programme was discussed at, and it does seem to have been at least discussed at this meeting. Yeah, yeah this one. Um, just reading those first three paragraphs, executive summary, impact and the poll FS accounting system may um, have moved on significantly since the last report. The system is not yet processing all transactions correctly, and so uh, the end state of POLFS ledgers, which automatically interface to the main business account, have not yet been achieved. However, manual adjustments can and are being made to the ledgers uh, for the year end. Uh, the adjustments include several missed postings, which individually are very large, but which in most cases are substantiated. Uh, where full substantiation has not yet been provided, there is clear ownership to ensure that they are evidenced for the year end. Uh, so it does seem as though there was some touching on an issue during the early stages of the impact program within this committee. But is that really the height of uh, issues relating to Horizon being brought to your attention and to yeah. the attention of those senior committees. Right, yeah, I mean, this, this was a particular issue which, um, to be fair to Peter Corbett, he had flashed up right at the early stage that he wasn't satisfied with the quality of some of the balances in the post office ledgers. Um, but 
also the difficulty they had in getting that sorted out was far greater than they thought. But my understanding, this is all inside post office, not outside post office. Thank you. And this is March 2006. We saw those earlier um, <coughs> emails and documents relating to ongoing litigation relating to the Horizon system. Um, I, I assume that nobody put two and two together in relation to problems with the Horizon system and ongoing litigation. I, I, I don't think this was the outside of the post office business bit of Horizon. This was the stuff inside the post office in the internal accounting system. So this didn't affect sub post I, I was told it didn't, but, Thank but you. you know. Going to now turn to a new document, that's poll 00329630. And this takes us to the 9th of February 2006, it's um, minutes of the Post Office Board. This is a, a few months after we saw the discussion regarding the growing number of Horizon cases and the coordination of those cases. Could we please turn over the page to page two? We've mentioned one committee already, the, the risk uh, committee. It looks as though at this point there's a further committee being set up. It says Sir Michael Hodgkinson reported uh, that the board would need to maintain its focus on sales and a significant part of the April board would be devoted to this issue. In light of the continuing need to focus on sales in the context of other important strategic developments, the board agreed to the formation of a subcommittee of the board, which will be chaired by yourself and include all executive directors. Can you assist us with the purpose of, of this particular board? Right. The, um, the issue at this point in time was that a lot of the, uh, the home telephone and the currency had actually started to go quite well. But the pickup on the insurance products and the other new products was much slower than everybody had thought. And so it was felt that if we really were going to get to the point where we could do the presentation to the government in a credible way of uh, showing that the financial services businesses were capable of arriving at certain levels of profitability, we really had to work very, very hard to ensure that the sale was picked up. And, and therefore we formed a committee to discuss all sorts of ways that we might be able to do this. So is there by this time essentially two committees that there would be two. There would be two. There would be two. Um, but this was more of an operations committee rather than a governance committee. You know, this was trying to get things done. Thank you. <coughs> if we look further down the page, there is um, a section on business sales and performance review. And if we scroll over the page... <coughs> We see there at C, operating profit was a loss of £104 million. Um, J, the current proposal um, for the 2006-07 budget was for a £190 million yep. pound loss, uh, £65 million pounds worse than 2005-06. Uh, K, traditional income was projected to fall by £100 million. Pounds. Uh, and then we have a section on solvency below. And it says it was reported to the board had been advised that given the concern over the solvency of the company and the board's legal duty to run the business with a view to minimising loss to the company's creditors, it was appropriate that the board should keep the company's solvency under regular review with a view to satisfying itself that creditors were not likely to be prejudiced by the company continuing to trade. In other words, uh, that the company was not likely in the foreseeable future to go into insolvent liquidation, leaving creditors unpaid. The board meeting was an opportunity for the directors to carry out such a review. Was this what you were talking about very early on in your evidence yep. about um, real financial problems by this stage? As I said right, right at the beginning, the, um, the company uh, desperately needed government money to fund, in particular, the rural network, and at the same time, uh, the loss of income from its traditional products. And um, 
we therefore spent a lot of time trying to make sure two things. One, that we could legally carry on trading vis-à-vis uh, -vis the creditors, but secondly, thinking of all sorts of creative ways that we could get money into the business, um, including things like letters of comfort from government, so that in fact we could legitimately sign off the accounts. Um, how bad were things, I mean, in the history of your career? <clears throat> oh, I mean, this was disaster by most companies' standards. You know, most companies' standards would, the, the business would have folded, but you've got the government money coming in uh, for the rural post office, which makes life, you know, much more complicated. And so uh, we knew the business at this stage was not viable as a standalone business. Um, but we had to make sure that we could still have access to the cash to carry on trading. Can we look at page six, please? <clears throat> And it says there in that first substantive paragraph, it says, it was also noted that negotiations with Fujitsu were ongoing with a view to amending and extending the current IT outsourcing agreement for the Horizon system until 2015. It was agreed that the contract extension uh, should not be formally signed until the directors were satisfied that the company would be likely to be able to meet its liabilities to Fujitsu for the full extended term of that agreement. Can you assist us with, with that then? What was the concern about... Right, well we had, we had with um, one hand, if you like, the need to carry on in trying to get a much more cost-effective horizon system. That was going to cost money, but on the right hand we hadn't got the money. So the question was how do we balance this? And I think in the end a contract, a provisional contract was signed with Fujitsu that depended upon um, actual validation, dependent on government money. So okay. it was trying to find a way through the minefield and keep the discussions going on the next generation. And on the subject of a more cost-effective <coughs> horizon system, if we look at page 14, please, page 14 into page 15, there's a section in these minutes that addresses Horizon Next Generation business case. It's at the bottom of that page. <coughs> and it says, Rick Francis introduced David Smith to the board. So yep. that's the same David X. Smith that we've yep. been seeing throughout this afternoon. Um, and the Horizon Next Generation business case was discussed. The board noted that it was essential that the post office achieved <coughs> significant reductions in IT costs to return the business to sustainable profitability. The major opportunity to do this resided with the Horizon system that was provided by Fujitsu Services under a contract that expired in March 2010. In March 2005, Fujitsu Services proposed a major investment in application, branch, and data center hardware, which would simplify the solution, enabling significant reductions in recurring operating costs on the basis that the terms of the existing contract was extended to March 2015. However, this proposition gave no scope for further reductions once the benefits of the upfront investment had been realized. Post Office Limited had negotiated a new deal with Fujitsu that delivered <coughs> significant guaranteed cost reductions on radically different terms to those in the current contract. Under these revised terms, Post Office Limited would be able to market test all components of the contract and Fujitsu services were incentivized to achieve further year-on-year -year cost reductions. If we look at F, it says the board agreed a further four million pounds of investment in addition to the six million pounds already authorized to continue development work in order to maintain the necessary progress to meet the post office business plan. The board agreed the deal with Fujitsu in principle but the board noted that it would be necessary to make the next investment decision in the April-May timeframe when the overall position on the potential to sign the long-term contracts would be clearer. Um, is a fair interpretation of this that at this time the focus was on a cheaper horizon, uh, one that led to cost savings? I would just add one thing, cheaper and no worse. I don't think there was any thought that the, um, in, you know, the, the lower cost was in any way going to degrade the functionality or the integrity of Horizon. But the long-term plan there was to achieve 
savings. Yeah, there was a, yes, well, it's crucial to make the business viable. And what we don't see here is, for example, any mention of the user experience uh, of Horizon, do we? That doesn't seem to factor into the thinking of, uh, certainly at board level. There was, a, there was a lot of discussion about the fact that this new reduced project for Horizon would not deteriorate anything in terms of quality. So we went forward on the basis that the, the, the cost savings were not reducing the quality of Horizon. And can you assist us with how the board was obtaining the information about the quality of Horizon for the user? So can you recall, for example, any internal or independent investigation uh, during that period of renegotiation that looked into the effectiveness of Horizon uh, and whether it was the right strategy for the user. Right. Um, the only external review that was done was with Gartner, which was looking at and reviewing whether the kind of concepts were reasonable and whether the pricing from Fujitsu was reasonable. I, I don't think there was a big survey done about the um, issues in the field, as it were. <clears throat> um, Although, so don't forget, all along, we did have, you know, the big crown offices, which were our own field testing. Do you recall during these discussions any questions being asked about the reliability and integrity of the data that is produced by Horizon? Not specifically in those formats. We certainly don't see within these minutes no, I, I any discussion no, I agree. those kinds of issues. But there, there were discussions that the quality would not deteriorate. I mean, that was a given. And who were those discussions with? Oh, just at the board level. And who would have been presenting a position on that to the board? That would have been David Smith and Rick Francis. Do you see this, the renegotiation of Horizon... Uh, as a potential missed opportunity in respect of improving the Horizon system? I think the alternatives we were faced with was, do we start again from square one? Um, or do we move forward with the new generation of um, the Fujitsu contract? And there was a lot of debate about the issue, and it was decided that this would be the best long way forward. I mean, it's, you can't say any more than that. It was debated whether we should change. And during that debate, did anybody raise any issues that sub-postmasters have been experiencing with the Horizon system? No. Um, wh whose responsibility would it have been to have raised those issues? That would now have been um, David Smith and Rick Francis. Uh, and who, sorry? Rick Francis. Thank you. Can we please look at RMG 00000033, please? This is uh, the same matter, but now being raised at the Royal Mail Holdings level. It reached the Royal Mail Holdings Board on the 27th of April, 2006. <coughs> I have no idea if I've got the number of zeros right, but it's lots of zeros, 33. So this is the first time that we'll have looked at Royal Mail Holdings uh, minutes during your evidence session. Uh, we have there Alan Cook, Managing yep. Director, Post Office, as a uh, present. We have yourself listed there as non-executive director. If we scroll down, we also have Mr. Francis, Rick Francis, Operations Director. Yep. And he's listed there for RMH 687, and that's what I'm going to be taking you to. Um, but if we slowly scroll down to page 9, um, we get an impression of the kinds of matters that are dealt with at this level. Um, a, a wide variety of different issues. Royal Mail Way, if we stop, sorry, just where you are and just scroll slightly up, uh, an entry about the vehicle replacement program we keep on scrolling down. Is there a tendency, I know that you've said that things were dealt with at this level, um, 
but for post office matters to be slightly overlooked or minimized given the number of issues <laughs> that this board had to deal with um, in relation to all of the work that Royal Mail's Holdings was responsible for. I, th I think at the time that there was a very strong view that um, the post office was being well run, had made amazing strides forward, and that the issues that needed to come to Royal Mail were coming to Royal Mail. Uh, I think the reason there's more letters stuff here is the, the scale of the investment that was being required in the letters business was much bigger. And, and the issues they were dealing with were much bigger. Um, so was a great degree of trust put in Post Office yeah. Limited by Royal Mail yeah. Holdings? Yeah, I think so. Uh, to, to operate itself independently. <clears throat> if we could please look at it, this is, this is it. Horizon Next Generation. <clears throat> so I think that this is the item that Rick Francis attended yep. this board meeting for. Presumably he didn't attend... Uh, on a regular basis, the role no, no, of holdings. No, no, no. no. Um, Horizon Next Generation, the board noted Alan Cook's paper and Rick Francis's further explanation of the business case for the replacement of post office's uh, EPOS system. Um, the proposed deal with Fujitsu offered a replacement system at a significantly lower cost than any of the other available options. I mean, did it, did it strike anybody that perhaps lower cost wasn't necessarily going to lead to improvements in the system itself? Well, th this was all done at the time when the general view was that Horizon was producing, you know, good, accurate information. <clears throat> For a total investment of £127 million, the proposed deal would deliver <clears throat> an incremental post-tax MPV of some £90 million compared with continuing with the current system and contract until 2015. Uh, Richard Handover pointed out that while the scale of cost reduction was commendable, in his experience of dealing with Fujitsu, cost reduction could also be accompanied by service degradation. Uh, Rick Francis noted this. Now, Richard Handover, he was a, a non-executive. Yep. Am I right in saying he was uh, the chair and chief executive of WH yep. Smith? Uh, was, was he somebody who was held in high regard by yeah, yeah, the board. No, yeah, I agree. Um, that seems to be quite a, a prescient comment that he's made there. And, and I think Rick Francis and the IT team took that on board. And as we went forward, we were told that these kind of issues, you know, service degradation was cu currently not likely to happen and that we'd covered it. You said we were told. Who, who was telling you? That would who? be Rick Francis and David Smith. They were telling you? Do you, do you recall the specific? No, the board. They were telling the board. Sorry, not me personally. So they were telling the post office board yeah. or the Royal Mail Holdings board <clears throat> that it wouldn't happen. Uh, well, of this particular thing, he, he had Rick had just noted this particular thing, but as we progressed further with the contract, that particular point had been noted. So it had been noted by Rick Francis. We see there, um, <clears throat> but it seems certainly. Um, the, the, the inquiry doesn't have a note of it being taken forward specifically in relation to Mr. Handover's comment. Do you think that some action actually did take place in relation to um, reassuring the post office that cost reduction wouldn't be accompanied by service degradation? Well, we, we were continually assured of that. You know, as I say, people are all the way through the project, people kept asking that kind of question. And who is we? The board. Reassured by who? Rick Francis and David Smith. And were you aware of who they obtained their information from? No. If we scroll down, please, after further discussion, the board expressed its support for the business case set out in the paper, authorised release of up to £25 million of capital in addition to £10 million already approved uh, to enable the continued development of the Horizon Replacement System, approved the post office's concluding uh, detailed contract negotiations with Fujitsu Services <coughs> as proposed in line with the parameters of the business case. This was subject to the post office receiving the funding issues currently uh, being discussed with government. Um, so what do you think went wrong? I mean, why do you think the warnings like that from a 
senior uh, non-executive director weren't, uh, weren't heeded or didn't lead to greater scrutiny? I, I mean, uh, we were told on the board of the post office that, in fact, we were guaranteed no deterioration in quality of service. And that question continually got asked as, as the project proceeded. Um, that's basically where it left. <clears throat> and finally, I, I'd just like to take you to paragraph 54 of your witness statement. It's <coughs> WITN 10660100. Paragraph 54. Um, you refer there to being provided with information. It's page 21. Provided with information at the end of your time at the post office. Um, you say, I do not recall hearing about any bugs, errors, defects, or concerns with the integrity of Horizon. Um, from recollection, the first time I heard any comment about possible problems with Horizon was in early August 2007 when I called into the office to say farewell to my colleagues. Uh, one of the senior area managers, whose name you don't recall, had recently received an audit report about a large deficit in one of the post offices in her area. Uh, she told me that her team had not been able to date to understand what the problem was, and she said she was wondering whether... Uh, there could be a problem with Horizon. She said her team were investigating all possible ways that the Horizon system might have caused the issue, but the investigation appeared to be at a very early stage. I trusted uh, that was all in hand. Um, do you think during your time at the post office that was the general approach of the board uh, to trust that all was in hand with Horizon? Um. I, in, not in, I, I think uh, the, the general view was that um, the system was working across a vast estate quite well. Uh, as far as the board was concerned, they were not getting um, lots of you know, information back saying there was a big problem. And therefore, we um, thought that Horizon was providing what it was supposed to do, and that is provide good quality information. Um, I mean, I, I, that's all I can say. Um, I, in, I mean, in, in a way, the, on this particular case, in, in a way it gave me uh, encouragement that if there were an issue, that it would be investigated in great detail. And, uh, you know, the, there were tools in place where if someone went to that level of detail, you could actually um, be sat satisfy yourself. Um, so I think, you know, that, that was where it was. <clears throat> Are you able to assist us? I know you've said in the statement you don't remember the person's name, but can you recall the area? Oh, it's south of England. That's all I know. Thank you very much. Um, so those are all of my questions. <coughs> uh, Mr. Steen has some questions. <coughs> yeah, Mr. Steen. Thank you. Sir Michael, uh, my name is Sam Steen. I represent a large number of uh, sub-postmasters and mistresses, and I'm instructed by a firm of solicitors called How & Co. Um, I'm going to just refer to your statement to start off with, please. By way of background, when you left university, you joined the Ford Motor Company, is that right? Yep. Then after that, you joined British Leyland, yep. and then you, uh, I think, became managing director of the newly formed Land Rover Limited, is that correct? Is that correct. Any of those companies, did any of those companies prosecute its own staff? Not that I was aware of. No. All right. So you moved then onwards to the Grand uh, Metropolitan Group, responsible initially for a major section of the Brewing Division, and then you became uh, Chief Exec of the European Food Division. Uh, what about the, the Grand Metropolitan Group? Did it prosecute its own staff? No. All right. After that, in 1992, you joined BAA PLC, uh, rising to become Chief Executive Officer of that of BAA in 1999. Is that right? Correct. Did BAA prosecute its own staff? No. Okay. So when you joined the post office, um, as we understand it, if I now refer to paragraph 62, sir, of your statement, um, <coughs> Sir Michael, that says this, uh, paragraph 62 of your statement, I can recall that SPMs were occasionally prosecuted for fraud 
which I think I learned during my induction process. That paragraph finishes by saying this, I do not have any recollection of these cases being discussed during poll board meetings. Okay, so let's piece this all together. So after leaving BAA, you join, the, uh, you join poll and then fairly rapidly become managing director, yes? Uh, um, in 2003. Yeah, I'm not managing director, chairman. Chairman. So in 2003, you take on that responsibility at, uh, at the post office, yes? All right. And during the induction process <coughs> in relation to um, uh, the post office, you learn that the post office prosecutes its own people. Is that right? I didn't learn that particular bit. I learned that occasionally people were prosecuted. I, didn't, I wasn't aware of the process of how it went. On. Well, let's just reread this. Paragraph 62, <coughs> I can recall that SPMs were occasionally prosecuted for fraud, yeah. which I think I learned during my induction process. So what did you learn during your induction process about SPMs occasionally being prosecuted? What, what it says there. Well, what bit? But you, the post office, prosecuted your own staff members. Somebody yeah. else did. The police I, I, did. I didn't, Tell us. I didn't know the process of the prosecution at that stage. Right. Okay, so when did you learn about the process of prosecution by the post office, of which you were chair? I think that was much later on. Well, help us, please. You left in, I think, 2000 and, what is it, seven? Beginning of seven, yeah. Right, so when, during the uh, period of time between 2003 to 2007, did you suddenly get told, by the way, we happen to prosecute our own people? I can't tell you the precise timing, I don't well, know. Closer to the beginning when you became chair or closer to the end when you left? I would say closer to the end. Right. And did you say to the people around you, well, <clears throat> that's a bit of a surprise. I'm a bit surprised that we prosecute our own staff. I'd like to know a bit more about it. No, I didn't. Well, you've suddenly been made aware that you're the chair of a prosecution authority. Yes? Yes? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, that's an unusual thing, given your business background. <clears throat> yes? Yes. What did you do to investigate that the post office was properly prosecuting its own members? I didn't do anything. Now, um, you're aware that obviously the branch post office system existed. You're aware yeah. of that much. Yeah. And you're aware that the branch post offices were run by sub postmasters, often living in um, the branch post offices, yes? Um, the traditional post office in the countryside, um, living in their own place, uh, having perhaps a small <coughs> grocery business at the side, yes? Yes? And you're aware that they would live there often with their families, yep. yes, and little businesses that they were. The, the, the typical scene for the post office branch that you can think of. Right, okay. Sorry, was there an answer then? No, yes. it Sorry. was an answer, yes. yes. It, can you just say yes instead of nodding? Sorry. Thank you. So by the time you learn <clears throat> that you're chair of a prosecution authority, did you say to yourself, well, we need to, be, um, we need to make sure that these little people who work in the sub-postmaster branches um, that are running these places within the community are dealt with fairly and properly by the post office of which I'm chair. Do you, did that occur to you? Sorry. Well, the, the whole process of um, prosecution, we thought, was based, first of all, on accurate horizon information. Secondly, there was a, an audit which was done by a separate group of people Thirdly, there was then an investigative branch that we had been told objectively investigated the case. And then there was a uh, legal analysis and a decision made whether to pr prosecute or not. So in the process, there were several individual people or individual stages of the thing, which um, is, a, is a pretty good uh, guise that it's fairly objective. So, Michael, as I understand your answers to me this afternoon, you've said that it was late in the period of time yep. of which you were chair yep. of the post office yep. that you learned that the post office prosecuted its own yep. um, sub-postmasters. So are you saying that it was late in the time that you were chair of the post office that you learned about all these systems of investigation, all these systems of using the Horizon system? Did that come late in the day? There's a separate question, is I didn't know in the beginning the process of prosecution, but we did know the fact that there was a whole series of checks on the way through whether a prosecution actually took place. Right. So you were at least aware that there was an investigation system oh, yeah. investigating your own sub-postmaster? Yeah. Right. Okay. 
So let's hold on for, that, for the moment to that idea. What did you do to make sure that the investigation system was carried out properly and fairly? What did you do, Sir Michael? Um, when the Risk and Compliance Committee, we did discuss the processes, uh, but they were discussed at a general level. So you individually listened to the discussion. Did you take part? Did you dwell on the detail? Did you find out what the investigation process was? We knew what the investigation process was and how it went about it. Right. We didn't know about individual cases or anything like that. OK. But you were aware on the second <coughs> part of what you said that the Horizon system data was used to support or part of prosecution. Yes. All right. Now I'm going to take you to paragraph 51, 52 of your statement. Mr. Blake touched on this before. So, uh, statement WITN 106601 paragraph 51 at the bottom of page 19. Bottom of page 19. Yes, thank you. And if you go to the bottom of the page 19, please. Right. So, Bottom of page 19, paragraph 51, when you became the chairman of poll, you requested uh, to further your understanding of the Horizon system, okay? And uh, you believe, uh, uh, you've been asked about the purpose of my request, you say here, and then you talk about the first poll board meeting. And again, you've been asked a couple of questions about that by Mr. Blake. Bottom of that page, it says this. I wanted to learn more about Horizon. I was interested in the capabilities of Horizon because of Paul's uh, board's strategic plans for growth into the financial services market, okay? Now, I'm going to take you page 20 to the last five lines of the top paragraph. And you'll see there, it says, however, we were entering into a completely different world with different products, and I wanted to understand whether the system had been designed with these products in mind, whether it was reliable, and whether it was capable of handling transactions of much higher value. Right. So, pieces together, what seems to have happened is that when you became chair of poll, you wanted to learn about the Horizon system, and for the reasons that you set out, you wanted to know whether it was reliable or not. All right. And we know, looking at paragraph 52, page 20, that you recall a meeting was arranged a few weeks after the board meeting to address your queries. And it, you go on to say this. I really cannot recall who attended the meeting, but I think it was the senior IT management and members of Fujitsu. So, you asked to have a meeting, and when you made your statement, your recollection was that it was senior IT management and members of Fujitsu that attended the meeting. Is that correct? Yes? Yep. You'll need to say yes or no, so that Sorry. The, yes. that's all right. Sorry. Okay, and you said early in your evidence that you, you, don't, you can't recall the numbers, but it was something like three to five people. Yep. Okay. Now, uh, help us a little bit more with that meeting. I'm going to take you to a document, which is FUJ 402037. <laughs> Now, this document is called the top application support service, fourth line, service description. It's got left-hand side, Fujitsu, Fujitsu services. And you'll see the date, which is in August 2006, okay? All right. Go to, further down that page, to the bottom of page one, you'll see who are the approval authorities for the document. And you've got their name, Dave Hulbert, <coughs> post office, <coughs> head of systems, operations, okay? And Mr. Holbrook was a long-term post office employee. He'd been part of matters before 1999, and by this stage, he'd risen to head of systems operations. Was he, by chance, anyone that was present during this meeting that you had when you were trying to make sure that the Horizon system was reliable or not? I have absolutely no idea. Okay. Let's have a look further down the page at other people that were around. Page two. Go to page two, you'll see there that it's got document history review details, mandatory review. 
under mandatory review, it talks, it there refers to post office operation support, post office commercial, um, those two individuals are Bernadette O'Donnell and then commercial is Mike Hannon, okay? And then there are the Fujitsu people mentioned, Pam Purewell, James Stinchcombe, Mick Peach. Right. So you can see that this is a joint document, Fujitsu and Poll, with those individuals present. Now, can we go to page nine, please? The very bottom of page nine of that document. <clears throat> if you look there under third line support service, as you've got there at the bottom of page nine, highlighted, thank you very much, it says this. The third line support service works closely with the application support service, fourth line, to provide bug fixes to enable the resolution of software incidents, okay? Right. So when you had your meeting with um, poll staff members and you think Fujitsu staff members to check to see if the Horizon system was reliable or not, were you told that were four lines of support for the Horizon system, which included third and fourth line to help with bug fixes? No, I wasn't told that. And the bug fixes were to enable the resolution of software incidents. Were you ever told that? No. Did you ever ask any questions about, well, what happens with this thing when it goes wrong? How do you fix it at that meeting? That, uh, not at that particular meeting. That meeting was purely focused on um, were, were, was the system capable of handling the new um, project uh, products that we were about to launch over the next two years. Well, it, it's a bit more than that, isn't it? Because you say in your statement that you wanted to make sure it was reliable for those well, purposes. Yeah, but, re yeah but, but the reliability in my mind was the whole capacity of the thing so that if everybody started drawing the money out of the banking system at the same time, there was capacity in the system to handle it. So that, that was the reliability thing that we were looking at, at that, or I was asking questions about. Right, so at that meeting, you weren't told <laughs> that there was an entire support system that related <clears throat> to bug fixes no. to make sure that any software incidents were kept under control. You said to, in answer to my questions that not at that particular meeting. When did you learn about the bug fixes? I, I, we, as I said all the way through, I, I did not hear lots of talk about um, uh, bug fixes, errors and defects. Well, you said to me not at that particular meeting, which seems to imply that you were told later on at some other meeting about bug fixes. No, no. <clears throat> okay. So, in essence, <clears throat> Sir Michael, it comes to this, does it? that you knew that the Horizon system data was being used in the prosecution of sub-postmasters, yep. yes? You knew that there was an investigation department that was investigating sub-postmasters, yes? At some point in your work as chair of the post office, you learnt that sub-postmasters were actually prosecuted by the post office, yes? And at no point did you directly try and find out exactly how this system worked in order to make sure that accurate data was used to prosecute sub-postmasters. Is that about it? If, uh, in terms of going through a personal audit of it, that's about it. And during your time, Sir Michael, people were prosecuted, people were told to pay up for any shortfalls, because apparently it was their fault, because <coughs> the post office didn't look into it. That was during your time, Sir Michael. No, I know. Is there anything you want to say to those people? I was going to say something at the end. Is this the appropriate time? Yes. Oh, right. No, no, I, I definitely want to say something. I mean, I, I have been saddened and appalled at the evidence that's come out over the uh, last 15 years since I left, where so many um, innocent postmasters and mistresses were unfairly prosecuted under the Horizon system and, as a result, suffered most dreadful experiences and devastating consequences, not just for themselves, but for their families. 
uh, and I just want to put on record that I apologise unreservedly for the fact that whilst I was chairman of the post office, I did not discover the uh, problems with the Horizon system. And um, all I can say is I'm very, very sorry for the misery that that then subsequently caused. So I apologise again unreservedly. So, Michael, I understand you apologise. What part of it was your fault? You, you just don't really know. I mean, what, what else could I have done? I mean, um, I, I just I tried to make sure the business was run as well as I possibly could. Where there were issues reported to us, I tried to make sure that people took action. Um, there's, there's a lot much you can do. I mean, th there are two ways I could have found out about information. One is reporting up from the organisation, and that didn't happen. The other thing that surprised me, and still surprises me, and in other businesses I have had this happen, you get letters from outside, from all over the place, that says you need to investigate this. And, and I, never, I never got that kind of correspondence or, or messaging. Um, and as a result, that's how I operated over the four years I was there. Thank you very much, sir. I think that is all of the questions this afternoon, unless you, sir, have any questions. No, no, thank you, uh, Mr. Blake. Uh, thank you, Sir Michael, for making your witness statement and for answering all the questions which have been put to you this afternoon. I'm grateful. Thank you. So we'll begin again at 10 o'clock tomorrow, Mr. Blake? Yes, that's correct. And can I just check? Um, because people tend to forget these things. Um, normally on a Friday we finish at three, but we've got two witnesses of, I guess, comparable length to today or, or not? Y yes, I mean, we, we certainly have a lot to get through tomorrow. Um, well, I was just going to ask whether people wanted to start at 9.30 to, to relieve them of the possibility that um, they would have to go significantly beyond three o'clock tomorrow. I see plenty of nods or people not shaking their heads. Um, providing all the arrangements can be made with the witnesses, then absolutely, I think that would um, be very helpful. Um, so perhaps we could proceed on that basis, and, and yeah, if it's going, going to be any different. That, um, we'll proceed on the basis that we'll begin at 9.30 tomorrow, unless uh, the inquiry has to um, send out a message to everyone that it'll be 10 o'clock as usual. Thank you very much, sir. All right. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye.